The Torah portion of Vaera begins with this interesting statement that God spoke to Moses and said, I am God. Well, doesn't sound very insightful at first glance until we look at the Hebrew rendition of the word God. It's not the same in both cases. You see, in Hebrew, there's two words for God. There's Elohim, which is the generic word for God. It's even used in reference to foreign gods. We talk about Elohim, Achirim, other gods. It's the generic word. Then we have the term Yud and a He and a Vav and a He, the Tetragrammaton, which we never pronounce because it's so sacred. And one way it's referred to is by spelling it backwards, Havaya. The name Havaya represents the transcendent God who is beyond time and space. It's actually implicit in the words. Havaya is a kind of conglomeration of three conjugations. Haya, Hoive, Viyye. Was, is, and will be. He's the God who transcends time. The uniquely Jewish God uh, of, the, of the Jewish Bible who intercedes in history to uh, indicate his will through the Torah. Now, let's reread the beginning of this week's Torah portion. Elikim says to Moses, I am Havaya, the God which you thought I am. Elikim, just the general God of, who is ruling the world, who is punishing the wicked, who is controlling the events of divine providence. I am actually Havaya, I am the transcendent God. And this is a very powerful message, because we always mistake the two. When things that are good happen, when think positive things happen to us, we say, thank God, we're rejoicing, new child, new job, we won the lottery, uh, all this great stuff. We always thank God, we thank Elohim, we thank the eminent God who seems to be intimately involved in our life. But at that moment, you should remember, Elohim is Havaya. The, the transcendent God, who is beyond time and space, who doesn't really seem to care about the details of life. He's there at that moment too, and it's really one and the same thing. And similarly, when God appears transcendent in your life, and God forbid there's tragedy, uh, you're confused, things are chaotic, remember, the imminent God is there too. This is the most profound statement in the whole Jewish Bible. Elohim is a vaya. That the imminent God is also the transcendent God. It's one and the same thing. It appears to us because of our mortal limitations as two different faces of God, but it's really one and the same thing. Chapter 7, verse 1, God says to Moses, I've made you a master of a pharaoh. What's the meaning of this? Now, in the Bible, generally, and in religion in general, we have this conflict between good and evil. We're given the good impulse, we're given the evil impulse, we're always struggling between our values of nobility and righteousness versus uh, the desire to be cruel, to be wicked, to be corrupt, to pursue pleasures of the flesh. That's the tension which traditional religion pitches at. But Kabbalistic insight lifts that whole discussion to a whole new level. We speak not only about the challenge between good and evil, but the underlying tension between chaos and order. The reason why we get confused, the reason why unfortunate things happen, the reason why we lack insight is because we have chaos. And the solution to that is order, tikkun, to bring structure, to bring healthy cognitive patterns to our life. And that is why God said I, to Moses, I've made you a master over Pharaoh, the secret of self-mastery, the secret of how to trap the pharaoh within us, that demonic side, our demons, is through order. And that is what Torah is. The Torah is a document of tikkun. It gives us practical advice and it gives us spiritual empowerment to bring order where there is chaos. Chapter 7 verse 7. Moses was 80 years old. Now if you do a little bit of math, the Egyptian exile lasted exactly 210 years. Take 80 from that and you have 130 years. So Moses was born in the 130th year of the Egyptian exile. What's the significance of that? So for avid watchers of Torah and Tan, if you're re watching religiously every week, the number 130 will ring a bell to you. Because go back to the beginning of time, the beginning of the story. First portion of the Torah, Bereshit, we read how Adam separated from his wife for 130 years, and everyone knows by now the insight of 
Rabbi Isaac Luria, 16th century Kabbalist, that in these 130 years, he fathered dysfunctional souls. And these dysfunctional souls were reincarnated again and again and again, and their final incarnation before they were healed was in the generation of Egypt. And that is why it took 130 years for the Redeemer to be born. Because the exile, which was a form of tikkun, it was a form of spiritual healing, had to run its course of the full 130 years, alluding to the 130 years where Adam created these dysfunctional souls, and once they had their tikkun, they were healed, the Redeemer appeared. Chapter 7, verse 28, we have the plague of blood, which is followed shortly afterwards by the plague of frogs. Now, these two plagues actually had an opposite polarity. Blood went from the trajectory of war cold to hot, whereas frogs went from the tra trajectory of hot to cold. How does that work? Because water's cold. I mean, even the Nile must be a hot river, but it's, it's cold water, whereas blood is warm. So transforming water into blood is going from cold to hot. Whereas the ovens, which were very hot, once if you put 500 frogs in a hot oven, it does cool it down to some extent. So uh, the plague of frogs is really going from the, tr the pole of um, heat to cold. What is the point of this? So life is about paradoxes, and the Kabbalah especially always teaches us to see the opposite side of every experience. When you are warm about something, you're enthusiastic about something, always ask yourself, should I be cold about this? And similarly, when you are cold about something, you're cynical, you're suspicious, try and ask yourself, should I be warm? I mean, typical examples are, you know, you want to have some fun and do something inappropriate. Well, that's, that's warmth. Maybe you, you know, at that moment, say to myself, well, haha, -ha, I should be going from cold, hot to cold. On the other hand, Often, you know, we're studying some Torah, we're uh, experiencing our religious heritage, and something strikes us as odd or bizarre or anachronistic or, or not understood. And cynicism kicks in, and we start wondering, you know, what is this stuff? Uh, who, who authored this? That's cynicism. And that's unhealthy, because to embrace religion, we need to bring out our warmth and our embracing side. So, the lesson of these two plagues is, when you are warm, worry about whether you should be cold. And when you are cold, worry about whether you should be a little bit more warm. Chapter 8, verse 15, we read about the finger of God. I mean, what is the finger of God? Um, don't we read in the 13 principles of faith that God has no body, or even the form of a body, a likeness of a body? So why is the Torah telling us he has a finger? Obviously, says Maimonides, it's a metaphor. God doesn't have any bodily parts. Uh, it is, this is purely to reach the ears of the general populace, uh, to make people understand uh, ideas about God. But it's only a metaphor, there are no fingers. The Kabbalists would beg to disagree. Now, no Kabbalist thinks that God has a physical body, or even a spiritual body. But what he did do is emanate out of him ten sephirot, which are godly. They're not God, but they're godly. And uh, they are the ten channels through which God flows his energy and beneficence to the world. And they're also the building block of man, since we were all created in the image of God. So it's our psychological uh, f tensions and energies are expressed in the different themes of the ten sephirot. God does have ten fingers, not in a physical body, and not even in a spiritual body, but in his projections and emanations of how he reached the world. And these, are, these do exist. They're not just metaphors for our misunderstanding of God. There are ten sephirot up there. They do act. And our ten fingers are actually a sign, a hint to the fact that man, woman, were created in the image of God, and therefore we have these ten fundamental building blocks within our minds, within our hearts. Spiritual message, I think one of the most powerful spiritual messages of the Parsha is chapter 6, verse 9. They didn't listen to Moses because of shortness of breath and hard labor. Now, thank God, most of us in the Western world do not suffer from physical enslavement and our inability to listen to the, our inner voice and to the voice of God, and to the voice of conscience, is not because of hard labor. But what we do suffer from is clutter of the mind, static, noise. Our minds are so busy thinking about worrying about the fears of our life, 
para jobs, para relationships, para concern for others. Then we have emails flying every five minutes, Facebook updates. I mean, if you set your phone to vibrate every time you get a text, a Facebook, an email, you don't even have time to think. We have so much clutter. So the solution is to redeem ourselves from this hard labor. Take a moment of stillness every day during your prayers, during your work. Just turn off everything, shut everything out, say I'm going to have 60 seconds, two, three minutes maybe. I'm just going to still my mind, clear out all the clutter, remove the static, and then you will hear the voice within. Please join us again next week for Torah and Ten.